So we're in the series, The Providence of God. How many know that there's probably a good chance that you're here because of the providence of God? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I know some of you have done some stupid things. I know in one time in the men's meeting, we had a testimony on one Saturday of all the men's meeting, and some of the testimonies were unbelievable about some of the crazy stunts that some of the guys in the church had done when they were younger. And it's like, they shouldn't even be alive, but they're still here. It's like, my goodness. But the providence of God. Amen. So I really think when we get to heaven, we're going to see that was God, that was God, that was God. He, and God was working all over my life, and I didn't perceive it. And I think God wants us to understand, understand and perceive I'm working in your life. You can praise me. That I'm, just because you don't see me doesn't mean the fingerprints of hand, God's hand are not in your life. So let's get to some scripture today. And We've studied the providence of God in Joseph's life. But we found out in the providence of God, yes, God is working mightily, but you have to participate in your miracle. There's not a time that we looked at anything in this series where God said, I'm going to work mightily behind the scenes, but there's going to be a day that you're going to have to move and do something too. So if you're sitting around and waiting for God to put money in your mailbox like that crazy stuff that came out of the 70s, it ain't going to happen. Get up and get a job. That'll put money in your mailbox. So... Now we're talking about Esther. Now I love the story of Esther in the book of Esther. And this is, you talk about a providential work of God. Esther is one of the two books in the Bible that the, the name of God is not even mentioned. The name of God is not even mentioned. It's not even inferred. The other book is the Song of Solomon. It's one of the two books in the Bible that are na named after a woman. And in those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, and I love this name, Big Than and t -Rash. I love that. Those are good names for killers. That's really good names for them. And those which kept the door were wroth and sought to lay hands on the king, Xerxes. And the thing was made known unto Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof therein in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. It was proven. They, they were both hanged on a tree. They were guilty. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Everybody say, what, a, what, what an interesting little thing. What an interesting little snippet in the Bible. What an interesting little part of that story. The Mordecai just happens to hear two guys plotting to kill the king. He tells Esther, and Esther tells the king. They investigate it and find out Mordecai is exactly right. What an interesting little snippet right there in Esther. So in Esther 5, 6, and 7, now this is a point where Esther has gone to the king, and Mordecai has told her, and this is where the revelation that, uh, that uh, Haman wants to kill all the Jews, and Mordecai tells Esther, you need to go see the king and talk to the king, and she says, well, you know, if I go in there unasked and uh, he doesn't raise the scepter, they'll kill me. And he says, well, maybe you were brought to king for the, to the kingdom for such a time as this. So my question to you, are, has God brought you to the kingdom for such a time as this in your life? So Esther says, well, if you all pray for me for three days, and go in at some fast and some prayer, then I'll go in and I'll talk to the king. And she says these famous lines, if I perish, I perish. So now she's come to the king at the banquet of wine. And is what is your petition? And it shall be granted unto thee, and what is thy request? Even to half the kingdom it shall be performed. So we got the king, we got Mordecai, excuse me, we got the king, we got Haman, and we got the queen at this banquet, the first banquet. Then answered, Esther answered and said, my petition and my request is. Everybody say is. Now that is, you could put an S, 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 S. My petition and my request is, can we have another banquet tomorrow? Yep. Now, in Christendom and among Bible scholars, here's, here's the debate. Did Esther, Esther freeze in fear? Or was she speaking in faith here? Faith. You sure? Because I got Bible scholars that will disagree with you. She's about to indict Haman, who's second in command to King Xerxes of all of Persia, and she's about to indict him as a murderer, wanting to kill all the Jews. She's about to indict the second most powerful man in the kingdom. So the debate in Christendom is, uh, was that fear or faith? Well, you've got to read the Bible to find out. So I know that the historians say it was fear. She froze. Everybody say she froze. Deer in the headlight moment for Esther. What's your petition? 
Uh, let's have another banquet tomorrow. So that's an interesting aspect of what she did there. So today I want to discuss, in the divine providence of God, was that fear, and we all know that we fail, and that God works in spite of our failures. Have you ever known that God will work in spite of your failures? Okay, I'll just, King David, Peter, I'll, I'll never deny you. God works in spite of your, favor, uh, your failures, brothers and sisters. If he didn't, I say sometimes he'd never be working. We all fail. And God works, I believe, in spite of all those things. So was it fear? Failure of fear? Is God going to be able to work in this? But there's two verses that we're going to read that indicate exactly what was going on. So you've got to understand, if I was in that situation, what would I have done? So I'm asking you to put yourself in that situation. You're about ready to indict the, most powerful, the second most powerful man in the realm to the most powerful man. And I can tell you, I've, I've done stupid things like that in my life. I can tell you, it doesn't go well when the man that you tell, he's a jerk, and he says, well, you know, he's one of my best friends. I can tell you, you've got to be very careful when you go indict somebody. You've got to really be careful when you go indict somebody that he may be one of the best friends of the guy you're talking to. Can you say amen? Be careful what you say. So we look at that, Haman, is that circumstance, coincidence, or happenstance that Mordecai hears of a plot to kill the king? What an interesting thing. And then he tells Esther, and Esther tells Xerxes, and, and it's an incidental circumstance, I'm sure. I'm sure it doesn't mean anything, really. But he, he tells, tells Esther. And so as we look at the book of Esther, we realize that in God's plan, that God works in divine reversal. And some of you here today because God has worked in divine reversal in your life. And you have got born again. You become born again. You've come into the kingdom of God and you quit all the crazy stuff that would have killed you or taken you out. And it tells us categorically that God does not even have to be seen to display his divine providence in our life. I have seen that there are times that I didn't even see the hand of God, feel God, hear God, and God was working providentially in my life and seen the hand of God. And it's like, wow, I, I didn't even know you were doing that. So did Esther freeze or did she act in faith? It's a good question. I think it's a great question. She's a divine plant by God himself, no question. The reality is she's a young girl. She's an orphan. Her mother and dad, the Bible says no trace of her. Whether they are killed, whether they are, have been taken captive somewhere else, nobody knows. And God has been merciful to her because he has arranged for a man to raise her, and that man is her cousin Mordecai. And he raises her as her father. He raises her in that situation. And he raises her in a godly way. And we know reversals are something that God is big in. Now, and remember Abraham and Sarah, they had no child. And now Abraham's the father of many nations. You remember the story of Joseph? He went from the prison to the palace in one day. My goodness, what a reversal. God can change things in your life, brothers and sisters. And we need to believe that and understand God can change things in our lives. And we have to put ourselves in a position for him to do that. So divine reversal is God saying, I have the final say. God saying, I have the final say in this situation. God said, I, I, I'm, I'm going to intervene in human affairs. And he said, I'll intervene on your behalf even behind the scenes and you won't even see me working. And God says, I know something. He said, this is what I know. The enemy has the plans and schemes to try to come against you and destroy your life. And he says, I'll work against the enemy that's working against you. Oh, praise God. That's a good thing to know. That God says, I'll work against the enemy that's working against you. Hallelujah. I praise God for that. So divine reversal is part of God's plan. It's God dealing with the enemy. It's the signature of God throughout the entire scriptures. It happens consistently through the Bible. And it's evident everywhere we look in the book of Esther. The fingerprints of God's alone hand and his identity alone is confirmed in Esther. If they were to try this case in court, God would be convicted by his fingerprints all over this story that he is the one behind the scenes. When you get to heaven, God will be convicted of being behind the scenes with his fingerprints all over your life. So the book of Esther, very, it's a historical context for sure. About a divine reversal when it's set during the Jewish exile in Persia. And the reality is the enemy has a plot to annihilate all the Jewish people in all of Persia from the Mediterranean Sea, and that includes the nation and the land of Israel, all the way to India. So why is this so important? And why would this matter to you? Because you need to understand something. If Satan can get rid of all the Jews 
and wipe Israel off the map, and they never exist anymore, you need to understand the Bible is false, it's lying, the promises aren't real, they're not good, and we can get out here and go ice fishing right now. Because God said, I made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I'm not man that I can lie, and I will not lie. If I made these promises, I will keep them until the time I return. So if God can break a promise to Abraham, he can break a promise to you. Mark Twain himself said it when they asked Mark Twain, and they found out, you believe in God? He said, I absolutely believe in God. And they asked him, why do you believe in God? You're the smartest man in the world. He said, because of one thing, the Jew, the Jew, the Jew. He said, with all the persecution they're face, they faced, and they're still on the face of the earth, there must be a God Almighty in heaven that's keeping them alive on the face of the earth. So I believe in that God who made a promise to that man, Abraham, that he has kept that people from being wiped off the face of the earth. Do you know how many times the Jews have been tried to be obliterated from the earth? And it's to get rid of the redemption of the line of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ that he promised was going to come from Abraham's seed, that seed which was a miraculous seed of Isaac, and Jesus said, I am of that seed of Abraham. Yeah, right. You get rid of Israel, there's no Redeemer people. Amen. Now can I tell you what's going to hasten the return of Jesus Christ? <laughs> the nation of Israel and what's going on over there right now? Can I tell you what's going to hasten the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? What's happening in Israel right now? Yeah. Yes. Amen. So, uh, geez, Pastor Steve, you, you, you're, just, you're just fascinated with these Jews. I'm not fascinated with Jews. I'm fascinated with Jesus and his word. That's what I'm fascinated with. I'm a student of the Bible, which made me a student of history, and I found out God really has promises in here that he's going to keep no matter what. So this is why I know that there's always been a plan to get rid of the Jews. It started with Pharaoh throwing the babies in the river. Haman, he, he tried to do it. We know Hitler tried to do it. And so right now I've never seen... Right in America, the anti-Semitism that has happened in America in the last three months is staggering. And, and I, deal with, I deal with some pretty heavy-duty people on this issue. And it's staggering how fast it has arisen. And now you have politicians and entertainers, and, and they're all in the camp for the Palestinians, and, and I mean for the Hamas and all that over there. Well, last week I explained it very clearly to you. Hamas, Haman. Haman, Hamas. Now you got it. What did Haman want to do? He planned to annihilate all the Jews in the realm of Persia. Do you know how, you know how many Jews that was? It was probably over 10 million Jews. From Israel to India. My God Almighty, people. This is how evil this man was. And God said, I have a plan, though. Everybody say, I have a plan. And Satan said, I saw that promise that he made to Abraham. I heard that promise he made in the garden at the seed of the woman. He said, I'm going to find out who those people are, and I'm going to go after them. I'm going to kill every one of them, and there will never be a redeemer come, and people will never believe God's word again, and you can't write a Bible because they won't believe it because they know he can't keep his word to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, he can. Right. He did, and we have Jesus Christ because of that today. So we look at Esther's life, it's a huge reversal of fortune. We can see the eyes of God all over her life and all around her. She's chosen out a queen from all 127 provinces. Bible scholars estimate there were probably 2 million women in that particular group of women they had brought. 2 million women, and Esther wins, and she happens to be Jewish. But what did, what did Mordecai, her father, stepfather, tell her? Don't you tell anybody your heritage. Don't you tell anybody your heritage. Don't you tell anybody your heritage. Just like I did now. I told you my heritage, and I got booed for it. My goodness, can you believe that? <laughs> I got booed for it, and it was the Irish part. Goodness sakes. <laughs> it just so happened at the king's gate that Mordecai hears of a plot to kill the king. And I love that name, Big Fan and T-Rex. <laughs> You're going to kill the king. And God just helps, so happens to have Mordecai there to hear it. But unfortunately at this time, unknown to Mordecai and Esther, Haman has a plan. And Haman's plan is based on the fact that he can't stand Mordecai because Mordecai won't do something. So Mordecai sat at the king's gate. <laughs> And he's one of the guys that guarded the king's gate, and he would look at people as they came in and out, say, yes, you can go in, no, you can't go in. And the servants repeatedly told Morty, when Haman comes through here, he's told the king, I want everybody at the gate to bow to me. The king says, okay, that's good, that's a good rule. So they make a rule, and they go out and tell, now when, when, Morty, when Haman comes through the gate, you've got to bow to him. So when Haman comes through, everybody bows except Mordecai. And Mordecai won't bow. And is Mordecai just got hard-headed, or what's his issue here? And then we realize that Mordecai won't bow because he will only bow to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So all the people at the gate say, Morty, why won't you bow? 
And I'm going to shorten his name, okay? Morte. Why won't you bow? And they get angry because we have to bow and he doesn't have to bow. Have you ever been at work where the boss is one way without you and the other way with others? And so they're like, why don't you bow? You need to start bowing. We're tired of bowing. You don't have to. He says, I'm not going to bow. And so they get a little bit angry and perturbed with, Haman, with uh, Mordecai. And they say, you know, Haman, by the way, did you know Mordecai is a Jew? And then they tell him all of his people in the Persian Empire are Jewish. And they're all connected and tied together. And Haman, he goes into a rage. And his original plot is just to kill Mordecai. That's his original plot. But he gets so mad and so angry, he decides, I'm going to kill Mordecai and all of the Jews in the realm of Persia. When rage and anger turn to rage and wrath, murder is always the result. Always the result. And so he goes about with his plot. He conceives his plot. The Bible says that the plot to kill all the Jews in Persia, they actually set a date and they cast lots, really. They're throwing dice and come upon the day that they're going to do this. He goes to the king and says, you know, we got some people that are different and they have diverse religion, di different dietary law. They don't obey your laws and they only believe in one God. You know, that really bothers Satan when you only believe in one God. He wants you to be like the world and believe everything's a God. The trees, the dogs, the frogs. I'm going to tell you, there's one God and he is God alone. There's no other gods. So he actually sets a date that they're going to kill all the... And the crazy thing is, King Xerxes says, okay, sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. At this point, I, you know, I'm like, come on, guy, what's, what's your issue? He, he goes on to tell the king, he said, they don't really profit you anything. So then here's what he does. He says, I'm going to buy them from you for 10,000 talents of silver. He says, I'm going to buy them so I own them, so I can annihilate them. And the Bible clearly says, men, women, children, old men, young men, old women, babies. My God. That's, your Bible says that. So the king says, okay, here's my signet ring. You, you do it. You write the letter, put my signature on it, send all the provinces in Persia. And so the letters are sent, and they're written to everybody in Persia, all the governor, satraps, all the people in charge. And oh, here's, a, here's a deal from the king. Here's a writ from the king on this day, on the 12th month, of, on the 13th day of the 12th month of Adar, we're going to kill Jews in our communities, in our towns. That's what's set up here. Can you say, but God? <laughs> so he offers to buy him, and, and what's interesting, the king says, keep your money. I don't need your money. And remember I told you that there were 10,000 talents of what? Silver? Everybody say silver. 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 That's interesting. Silver. I'm waiting for somebody to say it. Silver. 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 What does silver mean in the Bible? Redemption. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Silver represents redemption, and he doesn't even know what he's doing. I'm going to tell you, there are many times the devil's operating against you, and he doesn't even know what he's doing, and he's fallen in a trap that God has set alone. My goodness. Everybody say 10,000 talents of silver. That's the first time that we know in this Bible we begin to see the fingerprints of God in redemption for this whole process. Silver is so important there. We just read past that. Don't read past that. Then Mordecai finds out. He rends his clothes. And you know what he does? He goes in, puts on sackcloth and ashes. He goes into the streets with a loud cry. And there's much weeping and wailing of the Jews all over the land. And Esther hears out that Mordecai is in distress. And she sends a letter out to him a man, and with new clothes. And he says, I won't accept him. She's not aware of what Haman has done yet. So Esther sends Hatak, her chamberlain, to go to Morty and say, hey, what's wrong? And he tells her, here's a copy of the decree, and, and we're about to be annihilated. And he sends word to Esther in the king's decree to kill all the Jews in Persia. And now he tells her, you need to approach the king on behalf of your people. I'm glad I'm not Esther. I know all you would just walk right in there and say, King, bless God, I'm here, and I want to take command, and I want you to release my people and our people. I know you'd all do that. The problem is you walk in there, and he don't, he, if he don't lift the, lower the scepter, you're dead. Because he's surrounded by guards. And those guards were there to protect him from somebody running in and try to kill him or stab him. So unless the scepter was lowered, you were dead. 
She tells Mordecai that. And he says, well, he said, let me tell you what, sister. He said, I understand that this is difficult for you. And I understand that actually you could die in it. But he said, let me tell you something. God will send rescue to the nation and to the people. But don't think you will escape it just because you're the queen. And he says, maybe you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. So Esther says, okay, I'll tell you what. Here's what I'm going to do. You gather all the Jews in Persia and tell them I want three days of prayer and fasting. Everybody say three days. Three days. I don't know if we could get people in America to fast three days and three nights and pray for America. I don't even know if we could get that in America today, but we're looking at some dire consequences. It'd be wonderful if all the churches in America would get together and pray for three days and three nights for America. Wouldn't that be wonderful if the churches would do that? We might do that before the election, so get ready for that. Stock up, buddy boy. You might be sweating it up for three days. <laughs> so they have a prayer and fast, and after three days, she says, I'm going to go in, and she says the immortal words that if I perish, I perish. What is she saying? There are some things worth dying for. And I'm not telling you you've got to go die, but there are some things your flesh needs to worth dying for. There are some things your flesh needs to sacrifice for, okay? She says, I'm going to go for this. And she goes up, she puts on her royal robes, she approaches the king, and she obtains favor. In the sight, he holds out the royal scepter, she walks up, touches it, and he says, what do you want, girl? What is your request? And here's her request, can you and Haman come to a banquet I've prepared for him? King said, well, hey, sure, we, I'd love to, go get, go get Haman and, and let's get to the banquet. So they go to the banquet. And she said, at the banquet, then I will tell you what my petition is. And this is huge. We, you got, don't overlook the power of this moment. He comes to her in the banquet, and he knows something's up. And what it leads to. We've got to understand what's going on here. We don't see God here, but we see his hand. And I believe that there is a godly sequence that God is orchestrating and that God is working and God is moving and God is shaking and God is baking and God is moving people here and moving people there. And God is setting up a sequence for victory. And I think there's a reason that came out of this. And we'll get back to that. I believe that God is setting up a sequence that he wants straight. And a request. Spare my people. That's the right request. But how many know that sometimes you can have the right thing at the wrong time? Right. Have you lived long enough to know you can have the right thing at the wrong time? What happened to Moses? He, he, he sees his brethren that are being attacked by the Egyptians. And he goes and he kills the Egyptian. The right thing, wrong time. Right thing, wrong time. And it's the right request, spare my people. But it's the wrong time, and the banquet's over. And the request ends up being, let's have another banquet tomorrow. Let's have another banquet tomorrow. So Haman, he heads home, and he, he meets Mordecai at the gate on the way out of the, by the king's gate. And Mordecai will not bow to him. And he is furious, but the Bible says he holds his peace. Don't read past that. He's furious, but he holds his peace. Haman goes home, he gathers his wife and all his friends, and he tells the king's promotion and favor. He said, Queen Esther loves me. <laughs> the king loves me. He has made me rich. And I am favored by the king and queen. And they love me so much, they're having me back for dinner tomorrow. And he says, I am now the second in command. I, I, I'm huge. I'm on top of the world. And then he tells them, she only, the queen only invited me and the king. That's how important I am. Me and the king, that's who, that's who. Me and the king, that's how important I am. He's getting a little full of himself, ain't he? He's getting a little full of himself, ain't he? I don't know if God's setting this boy up, but he's he getting a little full of himself. Pride goes before a fall. And then he says this, but none of this matters to me as long as I see Mordecai the Jew at the king's gate that will not bow to me. He says, I have the whole world, but one man is causing me pain. One man is messing my life up. So Zeresh, his wife and her friends, they say, well, look, man, you're a powerful man in, in Persia now. Why don't you make a gallow 50 feet cubits high? And in the morning, why don't you go to the king and ask, you know, your second in command, say, hey, why don't you want to hang Mordecai on that? He says, man, that, that, that sounds good to me. And they say, look, after you hang him, then you can go to the banquet and you'll have a much better mood about the banquet. And the Bible says he was pleased with the plan. So his plan was to get up in the morning 
and go see the king and ask if he could hang Mordecai. Ask the king if he could hang Mordecai. My goodness. That was his plan. So he goes to bed happy as a puppy. Ain't got no sense. But that night the king couldn't sleep. The king couldn't sleep that night. And I believe in God's divine plan. God led this. Don't ask the petition the first day. Now the king's head is spinning. And scholars believe, and I believe, that the reason he couldn't sleep is he knows Esther is not a player. He knows she's the real deal. He knows she's up to something. He's not smart enough to figure it out yet. He's like, this girly girl ain't stupid. Something's going on. And it bothered him to the point he couldn't sleep. And Bible scholars believe that was directly by God's hand. Go ahead. You, go, you, you just go home and I'll, I'll tell you tomorrow what I'm going to I'm going to tell you tomorrow what my petition is. And the Bible said he couldn't sleep. And he was, you know how it is when you toss and turn it at night? Yeah. Anybody toss and turn at night, pretty soon you just turn the TV on. You put on some stupid show and you, they, they just bore you to death. Like that channel where they buy junk and sell junk or whatever it is. I can't remember what it is. But he puts on the Chronicles. Doesn't have a TV, so he calls the pages and he says, Bring me the Chronicles of my reign and read me something out of the Chronicles of my history as king. And it just so happened. Everybody say, just so happened. They read... In the Chronicles of the King, about a story where Mordecai had saved the king's life by telling the king about two men that wanted to kill him. They just so happened to read that. That's what they read. He's been king ten years now. There's a lot of stuff that's happened. And they just happened to read about Mordecai saving the king's life. And the king is he's intrigued by this. And he asks this question. Did we ever do anything to honor Mordecai? He just happened to ask that question. Did we ever do anything to honor Mordecai? Did we ever do anything to honor Mordecai? And they look through the records and they're like, nope, we never did. Never did. So the king gets a plan. The king gets a plan. He's up early. He's sitting in his palace. He's on the throne. Hmm, we never honored that guy. So he's sitting there in the palace and he hears some commotion out in the hall and he says, well, who's out there? And they say, well, it's Haman. He wants to see you. He says, okay, well, send him in. Send him in. So Haman thinks, this is my chance. This is my chance. King wants me in. I'm going to go in and I'm going to tell him, let's hang Mordecai. That was the plan with his wife and his friends. So let's go in. So the king summons him in, and the king watches him walk in, and before Haman can say a word, the king says, what should be done for the man the king wants to honor? And he didn't say his name. you got to catch this. He didn't say his name. What should be done for the man the king wants to honor? And Morte, uh, uh, Haman thinks, that's me. <laughs> that, that'd be me. So I'm going to ramp this up. I'm going to make this good. I'm going to make my son. What can I do for me? What should the king do for the man he wants to honor? So Haman says, well, guess what? This is what should be done to that man. He says, well, first of all, the king's robe. If the king actually wears a king's robe, should be brought and put on him. He said, and it should be done by a noble. And they should be put on the king's horse, the very king's horse himself. And ridden through the streets, led by a noble, proclaiming, this is what should be done to the man the king wants to honor. Thinking, boy, I'm going to enjoy this ride. I'm going to make Mordecai lead that horse. Oh, man. And he says he should be made second in command of all of Persia. Wow. Haman's full of himself. This is me. I'm going to have the robe. I'm going to have the crown. I'm going to be second in command. And the king says, Go at once! Go at once! 
The king commanded Haman, Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate and do not neglect anything you have recommended. Hallelujah! <sighs> have you ever had things backfire in your life? See, this is what I think you should do for the man. <laughs> give him a robe, give him a crown, put a crown on him. Yeah. And the king says, go do it to Mordecai the Jew. So this happens. He goes and does it. He got the robe, he got the horse, and he rode Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before the city, this is what shall be done for the man the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief. <laughs> And now he tells Zeresh and all his friends, he says, his wife and his friends, everything that happened to me, it didn't go the way I thought it was going to go. And his friends and his wife say to him, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, be the seed of the God of the Jews, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. Now, while they were talking, immediately the eunuchs from the king's court arrive and they say, Hey, dude, it's time to go to the second day banquet. That's important. Don't read past that. Haman had no time to make another plan. Haman had no time to make another plan. Do you see the hand of God manipulating and moving, and just like a puppet master, and moving things in this situation of God saying, I'm not there, but my handprints and fingerprints are all over this story. When you get to heaven, you're going to see how God was moving and manipulating in your life. And you thought, that was me. No, that was God. You thought, that was your boss. No, that was God. Right. So Haman, he missed a chance to hang Haman, hang Morty. So now he's at the second banquet with the king. And he knows, well, <laughs> things haven't gone real good today, but hopefully today will change things. So the king asks Esther in the second banquet of wine, what's your petition, girly girl? I know you're up to something. I know you're up to something. I know you're not stupid. I know this is not a ruse. And then Queen Esther said, O king, if it pleases the king, let my life be given for me at my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed and be killed and to be annihilated. And had we been just sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue. Although the enemy would never comp compensate you for the king's loss. And King Xerxes answered, he said to the queen, Oh, queen, who is this? And where is he who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, It is the adversary Haman. It is his adversary, the wicked Haman. My God, things have gone from bad to worse for old Haman. <laughs> Yesterday he's on top of the world. Now it's a whole different... Divine reversal, brother and sisters, is right in God's wheelhouse. I've seen it in my life, and I guarantee if you look at your life, you've seen it in your life too. Who would do this? His enemies is wicked Haman. And the king gets so angry in his wrath, he gets up from the banquet of wine, and he went into his garden. He's furious at Haman. Haman's my second in command, but he's an idiot. And so the king walks out into the garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. When the king returned from the palace, from the palace garden into the place of the banquet, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, Will you assault my queen in my very presence in my palace? And scripture says, As the word left his mouth, the eunuchs covered Haman's face. Now Harbona, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look out the window. See those gallows that are 50 feet cubits high? Those are the gallows which Haman had made to hang Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf. And he said, It's standing there at the house of Haman right now. And then the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. And the king's wrath was subsided. So now, I'm going to give you this story really, really quick. And I'm going to speed read, so you're just going to have to keep up with me. Because I want to tell you about but God in the story, okay? So due to Esther's godly pause. Everybody say godly pause. What is your wish, O queen? My petition is, 
Can we do this again tomorrow? Now let's look out of everything that happened out of, can we do this tomorrow? Okay? Everybody say, but God. So, so due to God, Esther's godly pause, producing the delay of the request, producing Haman's rage against Mordecai on his way home, which produced Haman's wife and friends to suggest a gallows for Morte, which filled Haman with joy, but Esther's pause had produced a sleepless night for a king, who produced the reading of the king's chronicles, which produced revelation to Morte saying to the king, which produced the question of what have we done to honor him, which produced a desire to honor Morte, and Esther's pause produced the, the, still producing the next day, which produced Haman coming early to the palace, which produced an impromptu meeting with the king, which produced the king's question, what should be done to the man I want honor, which produced a perfect plan for the man to, the king wanted to honor, which produced Haman having less to dress Morte in royal apparel and put a crown on him, which produced Haman having to lead Morty on the king's horse all through the town, proclaiming this is what is to be done for the king's horse, which produced Haman going home in shame, which produced prophesied by Zeresh, Haman's wife, that she would not prevail against Morte, which concludes with and coincides with the exact moment of the arrival of the king's chamberlains and eunuchs to drag Morte, uh, Haman to the uh, second banquet, and Haman came to the banquet, which produced no time for Haman to come up in, with any other plan, which produced the exact moment for Esther to reveal her petition to our king, which produced the exact moment to reveal Haman as the adversary to the Jews, which produced the wrath of the king towards Haman, which produced the king's anger, which produced the king's walking into the courtyard, which produced the opportunity for Haman to beg for his life, which produced Haman's carelessness of falling on the queen's couch, which produced the return of the king from the garden, which produced the opportunity for the king to see Haman's action was an assault on his queen, which produced the words of the king, how dare you assault my queen in my presence in my house, which produced the chamberlain's duty to cover Haman's face, which produced Harbona's munchin of the gallows Haman had set up for Morte, which produced the words of the king saying to hang him thereupon, which produced Haman being hanged on the very gallows that he had prepared for Morte. And I believe it is God's pause that she did not freeze in fear. She acted in faith. Amen. And that godly pause produced everything I just read to you. Sometimes you just need to shut your mouth. Sometimes. So now I'm going to prove this was a plan. Scott, we got that? Because Esther says something in her writings. In the, it shows that this was perfectly planned by God himself. Remember that little fast they went on? I know we don't think much of prayer and fasting, but I'm going to tell you, prayer and fasting is powerful. You want to get the heart of God, the attention of God, the word of God, sometimes prayer and fasting is the only, is my, might be the only thing you can get. And prayer and fasting demands that we, we, we sit down and be, be quiet before God. Get our mind off ourselves and get our mind on him. So I'm going to read you two verses in relation to Esther's plan that I honestly believe came out of the fast. I honestly believe this wisdom came out of the fast. So they can, they can argue all they want. Did she freeze in fear? Or was it faith? I believe it was 100% faith in her God with a divine word. So, I'm going to read you two scriptures in relation to Esther setting this up. So in Esther chapter 5 verse 4, and answer, and she's talking to the king, if it seem good to the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Let me read it again. And Esther answered, if it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Who she prepare the first banquet for? Haman. Let ha the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. It's little h, not big h. If it was God, it would be big h. Okay? This banquet was for Haman. This banquet was a setup for Haman. This banquet was a setup for God to get up and move up and shout up and begin to move in their life. And he was setting Haman up. Everybody say, for him. Okay, now I want to read preparation for the next banquet. If I found favor in the sight of the king, if it pleased the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman, everybody say Haman, come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them. Oh, prepare for them. Oh, so the first banquet was for Haman. The second banquet was for Haman and the king. Your Bible bears this out. And praise God I can read. And as I was reading that one time, the Lord's like, you didn't, you missed that, son. It's him and them. The first banquet was to set Haman up. The second ban ban banquet was for the king to make a good bidding for what she requested. So the first one was him. The second one was them. Amen. And now we understand 
that plan that was put in motion to destroy all the Jews. And honestly, that would have wiped out probably most of the Jews of the world, because at that time, that's pretty much where they were contained. There were very few Jews in Europe at this time. And Satan said, I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to get rid of that plan to bring a redeemer into the world. I, I heard that promise. I know that promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but, but I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of this people. And this is going on today. But you know, in World War II, it went on with Hitler, Hitler and the Nazis. And we have somebody in our, our church right here that her family, she lost family members in the Holocaust. So after church, there's, she has brought her book with all the history of her family members that died in prison camps in Germany. It's real, and it's real in the world today, and it's been going on forever. And what Satan wants to do now is he wants to stop the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he knows he's about ready to meet his end. Okay, the Bible says he, he, he knows the Bible, he just don't believe it. So, we see that on the face of the earth again today. I can't believe what I'm seeing in America right now. Hollywood stars that are pro-Hamas. Okay, go for that. Go for that. Be careful what God does, though. So divine reversal is a hallmark of heaven. I really believe that. David says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And I really believe this. The providence of God is like a Hebrew word. It can only be read backwards. So when it comes to God, trust the past to God's mercy. Trust the present to God's love. And trust the future to God's providence for your life. Amen. But I, I miss the greatest reversal of all. They took Jesus Christ and they tried him and they found him guilty and they hung him on a cross and they killed him and he was in the grave for three days but three days later he got up out of that grave. That's the greatest reversal the universe has ever seen. Right. Ever seen. And Paul writes about it, and here's what he says, But we speak of the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Those stupid guys. Anyway, it is written, I have not seen or heard what has entered into the heart of man, the things that God had prepared for them that love him. So here's what I had to tell you. The greatest reversal was Jesus Christ himself. Get him up out of that grave. Now, can I tell you in your life, the greatest reversal is you accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, take him into your heart, and now your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and thou which you would have gone to hell and spent eternity with hell, you are now going to be in heaven with Jesus Christ for time and eternity. That's the great reversal for your life because of what Jesus Christ has done. Can you say amen? So, what a wonderful story. It's all good and perfect right now, right? Mm-mm. I'm going to finish the rest next week. No, no, no. It's not over by a long shot. It's not over by a long shot. Because now, remember what I told you that when God is moving, he expects you to work in your miracle and participate in it. Next week, it gets unbelievably good. And it gets a little crazy. Gets a little crazy because of Persian law. <laughs> and the problem is in Persia they enforce laws, whereas here in America we just let them go. Anyway, yeah, just so. It's true. But next week you're going to find out, and I'm going to finish this story of the reversal of fortune for Esther and for Mordecai and for the Jewish people. It's an unbelievable story. So praise God, Haman's gone. Praise God, Haman. You know, Hitler's gone, but there's still some crazies out there. Okay? Now, how many appreciate God's Word? If you love God's Word, say amen. amen. Every word in here was written by a Jewish man or woman. Every one. Every one. Somebody say amen. God couldn't find any Gentiles to do it. He couldn't, so he had to do something. He had to find a people. He had to find a race. He said, okay, I can't find anybody else. I'm going to find somebody to do it. And he found Abraham. Bless God. When you get to heaven, I'm going to tell you, your greatest, one of your greatest conversations other than Jesus Christ is going to be Abraham. Amen. Amen. So then came a guy came Moses, and he's as great as they come. Probably the greatest preacher in the history of the world. And God came to Moses, and he said, I'll tell you what. He said, uh, you know, I want you to tell your little brother, that calf-worshipping brother down there, I see what he's doing down there, but I'm going to straighten him out. He said, I want to tell you to tell him this is what I want you to tell my people so that they'll understand I'm always working in their life. 
So you'll understand God's always working in your life. He said, tell him this. Tell him this, he said. The Lord bless you and keep you. That sounds like he's working to me. The Lord will help his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Sounds like the Lord's working for me. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance on you and give you his peace. Everything I just spoke says to me God's working, even if I can't see him or feel him. He's working on my behalf. And God said, if you put my name on your children, I will seek them because we are in covenant. If you agree, say amen. amen. Hello, one and all, and thank you for tuning in. If you'd like to mail in tithes, gifts, and offerings, you can send it to P.O. Box 2223, Sholo, Arizona, at 85902. And please, like and subscribe. Helps out us, helps out the channel, and tells YouTube you want to see more content like this.